because of situations that are going on around the world. I believe it is important for everybody to understand the 70th week of Daniel. But this is Old Testament. If you've ever wondered if the Word of God is true, then maybe something that I will share with you will help you to see that you can trust the Word of God. And you need to understand who we are, where we are, and what's going on. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, it's on your screen, says, And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and for the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof. There shall be a flood, and unto the end of the time wars and desolations are determined. So this is a, a prophecy in the Old Testament about the 70th week of Daniel. But here you have 30, a, three, a score in two weeks. And if you look there, uh, that's going to be a period of 69 weeks total. Three score, 62 weeks. So 62 weeks, uh, there's something missing there. And you can see it. Because this is the 60 weeks, it's 434 years till the, the Messiah would be cut off. So this is telling us in the Old Testament in advance the very year Christ would come and die on the cross. He came right on schedule. And this is the three score and the two weeks, but the Messiah would be cut off there at the cross. And so that's where you take your timetable to. Many people go to the birth of Christ, and it's to where he was crucified for us. And therefore, their timing is off. Now, when we look at this, we find out Jesus said unto them in the second chapter of the Gospel of John, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, it says, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Because uh, the, he was speaking about his body, and they thought he was talking about the temple. So this is where the temple was. See, it was 46 in the building, but it was about three years' time that Ezra and Nehemiah all got back there, rebuilt the walls, and all the work gets done. So the timetable stays accurate, but you've got to know where to start, and that is at the cross. Cross is always the, the main thing. It's the center of history. It's his story. What goes before him, and what comes after him. Now, when it says, that shall come, that's a prophecy about the prince. And of course, if it's 69 weeks up until the time of the cross, which is right here, then we should have the 70th week, which is right here, follow, that's the 70th week, and then we have the kingdom upon the earth. So 70 weeks are determined, 490 years, that ends when the kingdom reigns. So God has laid everything out perfectly in order, and we're watching time unfold. In the Old Testament, it talks about in the process of time, in the process of time. Time has been processed. So God has appointed a time in which things will, will happen. And that's not going to be changed by man. Now, God has chosen in his sovereignty to give to man a free will. So God is working his will at the same time he allows man to have a free will. Now, the prince that shall come is the Antichrist. And that shall come is future and after the Messiah is cut off. You can see that. It's also he will destroy the city and the temple after it has been rebuilt. And so that has happened. So the Bible says in Daniel's time that the Messiah will come and be cut off and the temple will be destroyed and the city. And as you look back after 2,000 years, has that been fulfilled? That has been done. This is also because of history is repeated because people do the same stupid things over and over again. They never learn. It will also happen once again in the 70th week. He says, until the end of the 70th week, wars are determined. So we know that there's going to be wars all over this earth, all over the world, until Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the 70 week of Daniel and sets up his kingdom upon the earth. So I am not surprised to see all the wars that we've had for the last 2,000 years. God promised that. He says they'll be in troublous times. Now, this is as Daniel prophesied. When Daniel looked at this, he talked about the 69th week up until the cross. He talks about the 70th week, which is the seven years here. And he talks about the millennium, the age that will come right after this. Now this is how, when you read it in the Old Testament, you'll see it. There was nothing about the church age written in there whatsoever. 
Now this is how Daniel's prophecy has been enlarged. Because the king was rejected and crucified. We now have what we call the church age. The church age. That's the period of time in which you and I live. Because the king was rejected, the kingdom was postponed. And because the kingdom was postponed, the 70th week was postponed. It means that these times are shoved out into the future. There is here for the church age a time limit unknown. This is where we're always trying to figure out when the Feast of Tabernacles is going to take place. We always want to know, well, when will this happen right here? And so in many times, in studying the book of Leviticus chapter 23, we want to know, is this the year? Is this the month? Is it October? Is it September? What year will it take place? Because seven years later, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to come back to the earth here in power, in great glory, and will set up his kingdom upon the earth. So we are not looking for the seven-year tribulation. We're looking here for the rapture of the church. So we have from the Pentecost until then, the church age beginning. It ends when the Lord takes us out. That is an unknown time. That's why when we do not really know the day or the hour when the Lord will come, but we can know when it's pretty close. And when we know what happens during the tribulation period, that 70th week upon the earth, the seven-year tribulation, then we know that we must be very, very close. I've said before, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, something is going to happen in the Middle East that will cause the nations of the Arabs to make a peace treaty with Israel. It's going to be very difficult to see how in the world is that ever going to work. Because I said that they would have to become democracies. And so now many of these nations are choosing to have democracy where they vote on whoever they want and not the dictatorial rule that they have because the Bible says these nations will vote to give their power to one Iman, or I should say whoever their leader is going to be, and he will make a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. It will fool the world. They will show you that you're trying to be honorable and peaceful, but it's going to be very, very deceptive. Now that's what's coming. It's interesting to see how fast something can happen in just a couple weeks. I know it on my body physically how fast it can happen, let alone in this world. So we have here the three and a half years because he said he will make a peace treaty with Israel, this covenant, and this covenant will be in the middle of the week. He will break the peace treaty. And that means that Israel will have to become a nation. There has to be a temple built in Jerusalem. They will have to institute their sacrifices once again because he can't cause them to stop if they never started. So I believe that that day is coming. The peace covenant that we're always talking about, they need a peace treaty with Israel. Well, the peace treaty, I believe, has to include Israel's right to exist as a nation. Israel's right to the land. Israel's right to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. And I believe Israel's right to sacrifice on the altar. So that's coming. How in the world is this going to take place? Uh, there was a picture the other day on the news of three men that were being interviewed and how they did not, they did not want Mubarak. And they had a big old circle on him and they had the Star of David on it. Because Egypt has kind of had some peace with the nation of Israel uh, since Arafat back in the 70s. And also with Jordan, I believe the only two Arab nations that did. They could tumble very quickly. But what's going to be the result? Somewhere down the road, there is going to be a peace treaty made with Israel. And it seems like it will be just the opposite. But if they become ugly, somebody else is going to have to straighten them out. How it's all going to play out, I don't know the details in between, but I know how it's going to end. And that's what I focus on. What God does say. Not what He doesn't say. I don't care how God's going to do it. Only I know that God will do it. And His will will be performed. It will be carried out. Now, we have the time in which uh, the church age is going to begin. And I believe very strongly that the 69th week ended with the crucifixion of Christ on the cross. The 70th week is out there in the future. So we saw that in between is the period of time God calls the church age. 
And on the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came. Now, that is the beginning, I believe, of the church on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was to be 50 days from the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, when Christ came back from the dead, this was on a Saturday in the evening, I believe. So Christ came back from the grave on a Sabbath. So there's 50 days in between. And he says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, and verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. So the morrow after the Sabbath, seven Sabbaths, that'd be 49. So that would make it 50 days. So he says, Even unto the morrow after the Sabbath, Seven Sabbaths shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So fifty days, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, just like God had promised. That's why it's called Pentecost. It means fifty. So God's word in the Old Testament, written a thousand years in advance and more, tells what's going to take place, and that these are types and signs of it. And he says in John 14, verse 16, he says, And I will... Pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye shall know him, for he shall dwell with you, and shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of a promise that Christ made. He's the one that says, I will ask the Father. So you and I do not receive the Holy Spirit as a result of us praying and begging and whining and pining and moaning and groaning for God to give us a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That happens the very moment you trusted Christ as your Savior. Now, in John chapter 7 and verse 38, he says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit that they which believe on him should receive. He says, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Christ had not yet been glorified. He had not died, paid for sin, come back from the dead. So the Holy Spirit wasn't given yet. And so he was given on the day of Pentecost as a result of a promise that Christ had made. Now, he says in Luke chapter 24, even though they were going to receive the Holy Spirit, uh, they were not to go yet. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, but not yet. Because he says... Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So you were commanded to go, but you were also commanded to wait until the day of Pentecost, until you receive the Holy Spirit to give you the power to be the witnesses that we're supposed to be. Because to do what God wants us to do takes supernatural power. It takes God's Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, And been assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. So the Holy Spirit was a promise from the Father, but it begins something that's wonderful. It began the birth of the church. So the church was born on the day of Pentecost. There's many people that believe it started with John the Baptist, some say it's just a, a layover from the church in the wilderness in the Old Testament. No, there is a beginning and an ending to the body of Christ. And it started on a particular time, at a particular moment. And I'll show you that in just a second. But he says, Wait for the promise of the Father which saved you, ye have heard of me. And for John truly had baptized with water. He says, But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Ghost, not many days hence. So we know that after Christ came back from the dead, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was going to take place very soon, not many days. And it was a fulfillment of the promise that God had already made. Now, Christ had promised the person of the Holy Spirit was just like Him. He promised that the Holy Spirit was coming within, within days, and the power of the Holy Spirit was that we might be witnesses. You see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be famous and rich and without pain. And No. Ye shall be witnesses 
unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So God gave the great commission in Matthew 28 before the Holy Spirit came. But the great commission, even though it was given before the day of Pentecost, they were to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. So the great commission was to begin on the day of Pentecost. That was the beginning of the great commission, the great command. Now, the authorization from the highest personal authority, there is no one greater than God, nobody higher. Lo, I am with you always, the continual presence of the Son of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. So he says, go ye, that's personal. I am with you, and that's presence. Ye shall receive power, the awesome, dynamic, dynamite, explosive power of God is to do the work of God. You see, when I read these letters that people send, and there's many of them, and calls and so forth that I get, over almost 50 years, I have seen the dynamic, explosive effects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That a man can be in the Philippines and he can hear the gospel and trust Christ as Savior. Or somebody wants to pull over the side of the road because of the power of the gospel that they hear and they understand. You see, you and I can't do that to people. The gospel is powerful. It is dynamite. And that's why the devil fights the clarity of the gospel more than anything else in the world. And that's why in spite of that, we fight back. And we defend the gospel. And we project the gospel. He says, ye shall receive power. And that's the power that you and I need to do the work that God has given us. You and I have all the power to do all that God wants us to do. You don't need any more. He said, we don't use the power. We don't believe the gospel will work. We're afraid to witness. We're shy. We're timid. We say they don't want to know. They don't want to hear. Where do you think all those thoughts come from? Not from God. They don't come from Him. The personal authority is from God to each individual. Go ye. If you want to know who you are and what you're about, what you're to do, your command, here it is. You cannot... Use it as an excuse. I didn't know. You will know when you leave this room. This personal authority is from God to each individual. Go ye. This personal presence is from God to each individual. I am with you. The personal power is from God to each individual. Ye shall receive. Ye shall. That's a promise. So we believe that the thing was moved out into the future. See, the 70th week was shoved out into the future because of the church age. And that's where you and I are. It almost looks like a picture of our church, don't it? So we might change the color a little bit. But I did do this before I came down here. I'll change it next time. But the church age is very important. Now get this. The church age is not replacing Israel and its promises. Those are things God made to Israel. I don't believe in the replacement theology. I believe that what God promised Israel is to be and will happen and to the nation. But God has made something brand new out of individual believing Jews and Gentiles. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself in the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye are also built together in the, for the habitation of God through the Spirit. So in the Old Testament, they had their tabernacle under Moses. And then under Solomon, they had their temple. When Christ was here, they had the temple, Herod's temple. But you and I, when we trust Christ as our Savior, remember the presence of the Holy Spirit indwells us. Your body is now the temple of God, just like the tabernacle was in the Old Testament. And that is a holy place. You and I are not to defile the body of God, for the body of God is the temple of God. He lives within you and within me, and wherever we go, we're like little tabernacles of the Old Testament. But God says, all of us, fitly framed together, buildeth a tabernacle or a habitation for God the Holy Spirit to live in. You and I are the body of Christ. 
and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, fitly framed together. The apostles and prophets laid the foundation, but Jesus Christ is the rock, the foundation. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. In other words, it is not Peter. Peter is not the rock. He was only a little pebble. But the truth that he said when Christ made the statement to him, who do men say that I am? They said, maybe Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He says, but whom do ye say that I am? He says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Christ says, upon this rock, that statement that he made, I will build my church. Not upon Peter. He never promised to build anything upon Peter. But he did give him information. And he says, thou art a stone, but upon this rock, I will build my church. So Christ is the rock. The church is built upon Christ. It is not built upon any man. And he says, we are to grow together as individuals through receiving the word. We are built together as we work together applying the word. This is why I want God's people to work together. Because not to work together is not to fulfill the word of God, the will of God. And you and I will be simply people who have taken advantage of a free gift of salvation. We have eternal life. We're going to heaven when we die. But let the rest of the world go to hell. I am not that kind of an individual. I will do what I can. I'll try to challenge as much as I can. And I'll go until I can't go no more. But we've got to do the things that we do, and we spend what we spend, not for ourselves, but because of the people that we can reach. We're running out of time. We're at the end of this dispensation. I believe Christ is coming back soon. There's so much that needs to be done. And it's not a game to me. I hope you all get that idea. Ephesians 2.15 says, Having abolished in his flesh... The enmity, even the laws of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself, in himself, up to, Jews and Jedi, one new man. And so make in peace. So that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them of that were nigh. For through him we both have access by the Spirit unto the Father. So God now... Is taking believing Jews, believing Gentiles, putting them together, forming one body called the church, and given to us a responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why we work. That's why we pray. That's why we give. That's why we want to support missionaries. Because when we can't go, we're to send. It's the will of God. Now, for those who are far off, that's the Gentiles. Those who are nigh, that's the Jews. So both believing individual Jews and Gentiles form this new one body called the church. The death of Christ abolished the old contract and raised up a new man, the church, and is of himself. 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 and verse 12 says, For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ, for by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So this is what God has done for us, and it's so important. Christians, hear me well. This is your heritage. It's your family tree. This is who you are. It's where you're from. It's what you're about. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, I don't have all the answers to everything that's going on in this old world. But I do believe that we're living very close to the time when Jesus Christ is going to come back again. The only reason I'd want any of y'all to go to camp is not because I need camp. I don't need camp. I don't need to be challenged and motivated anymore. Sometimes I'm so motivated beyond my ability to perform. But I know that there's other people that need to know the Word of God and to be challenged. And sometimes by isolating yourself from all the cares of the world and just for a few days, you concentrate upon what is the will of God for me? What does God want my family to be? I'm so thankful that I've got a good daughter that loves me to death. I'm so thankful that I've got a, a son that loves me and loves the Word and loves his family, loves his kids, and 
wants to serve the Lord and does what he can do. I want that. I want it so bad. I want my grandkids who are struggling right now. I think every dad wanted his grandkids to serve the Lord. But if you live long enough, you realize you, you can't make anybody trust Christ. You can't make them love the Lord. You can't make anybody serve the Lord. No preacher can make the people in his church do anything. You can only teach truth and hope that truth will grab a hold of you and says, I, I want to do this. I, I want something more in my life. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of John, chapter 3. The Gospel of John and chapter 3. I want you just to simply look at a few of these simple verses that you and I take for granted every day. Look what it says in verse 17. John chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. So that's why I don't really need to go into the world condemning everybody. And God's already done that. I just let people know that, yes, we have all sinned. But I don't have to hammer upon their sin and how bad you are and how wicked you are. Most people already know if you're not perfect, you're a sinner. But God loves sinners. And when Christ came into the world, He didn't come to condemn everybody. He came to save everybody. But you can't get saved unless you know you are condemned. So it's not me condemning a person. And I had a man tell me one time, he says, Who do you think you are, the judge? I said, No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the judge. I'm just telling you what the judge said. I'm just telling you what the judge said. The judge, he says that we're all sinners. And that I'm no better than you. There's no difference. We've all come short of the glory of God. All of us. And we're all in the same boat. But look at the last part of that verse. He says, but that the world through Him might be saved. Do you believe that? That God wants the whole world to hear the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's so important for people to believe that God, God can use me. And I want to be used. I want to do something for the Lord. I want to take some teenagers and challenge and motivate them. I want to teach some little kids in some class to know the Lord early and to be able to learn to love the Lord and teach them some verses and plant seeds in their little minds. And just because we start getting a little bit older doesn't mean we can't still plant seeds. You may not be able to do all the things you used to do, but you can still plant some seeds. And you know, if every family only reached their family, if we could win the world... No, we don't do it. If we could just get our kids and grand people and you know, aunts and uncles and everybody to know the Lord, wouldn't it be neat? But don't let that go. Now, I want you to hold your place right here and look in Luke chapter 16. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Luke chapter 16. You heard the story over and over again about how that Christ came into the world to, to save sinners. And you've heard the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Where it says in verse 19 of chapter 16, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Yankee, uh, Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, also desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Moreover was the name of the dog. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell he lift up his eyes, been in torment. Seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So when you go down through here and you look at these things, you think, now, just how much can I get from what these verses say? What does this tell me? All right, there's two men, and two men died. One is in paradise, and one is in torment. So who tells this story? Jesus Christ tells the story. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses tell me, well, that's just a picture. I said, a picture of what? A picture of what? It's a picture of two men who die, and one goes to a place of torment, and one goes to a place of 
paradise. That's what it's a picture of. If it's not true, he should have said so. But he mentions the man by name. So it's not a parable. It's not a made-up story. I'm supposed to believe this is true. He talks about Abraham. And so it says what Abraham said, what the man said. And if they didn't say that, then Jesus is a liar. Duh. I hate that. In verse 24, And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am comforted in this flame. I am tormented in this flame. Could you turn on these lights up here for me just a little bit? I don't know how you turn on lights a little bit. Because either they're on or they're off. Thank you. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's very helpful. I, I can almost see my Bible now. But he says in verse 25, And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. So that means that there is another lifetime. In this lifetime, does God know who is doing what and where people are and everything that they've done? He recalls what they did. He says, in thy lifetime, get this. He says, uh, thou receivest good things and likewise lads of evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. So there is a God in heaven that knows what you are receiving, what you are going through and how you are suffering, how you think, how you feel. God knows all of this about all of us. And He knows what uh, all about this this lifetime. So you and I are supposed to be, believe that, that there must be more than this then. There's got to be something else beside this. And so He says in verse 26, Besides all of this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us which would come from them. In other words, if, if a man in paradise could see the man in hell suffering, he couldn't bring him any water. He can't comfort them. He can't go to them. Can't console them. Can't do anything for them. That's what the Bible says. The people that are already in hell, they can't get out. They can't get out. Picture yourself for a moment in hell for all eternity in a literal lake of fire knowing you'll never get out. You'll never, never get out. It will always be like this for all eternity. And you think, it didn't have to be this way. And God says He will take all of us and wipe away tears from our eyes because there's no way that you and I will be able to watch those that we know and love suffer without having to wipe away our tears from our eyes. And He says there's time coming when He'll, he'll say the former things will be remembered no more. Now how God's going to do all of that, I, I don't know. I don't care. But I'm to believe that this is true. And there's something else that He says here. In verse 27... He said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. Send him to my father's house. I've got five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He has five brothers on their way to hell. And he knows it. I've got five brothers on their way to hell. And the only thing that's going to stop, that means that they're either unloved, but we know they're lost, but maybe they're unloved by people. Because evidently, somebody has to get the message to them. He says, send somebody, they, they may testify to them. Because unless somebody does, they're not going to hear. And if they don't hear, they're not going to believe. And if they don't believe, they're coming to this place. Now, I want you to think for a moment. Your mother, your mom, your dad. Do you love them? Do you care really where they spend eternity? Do you really believe that if they die today, they're going to go to hell? If they're not saved, are you dependent on somebody else to reach them? Have you poured out your heart to them? Do they know that you love them and do they know that you care about them? Do they know that you want them to go to heaven? Have you ever attempted to talk to them about the Lord? Shame on you if you haven't tried. They may reject you. They may shame you. Have nothing to do with you. But you would be better off if you tried and fail than to never attempt at all. But what about sons and what about daughters? What about your aunts and your uncles? 
What about sometimes the people that you work with? Or somebody you're close to? And you get along with them. You can talk about football. You can talk about this and that and the other. But you never can talk to them about the Lord. Why? Why, why is that? If I was the devil, I don't care what you do with your life. I don't care what you talk about. But don't you talk to people about the Lord. And yet what is the one commandment God gave to us? Be rich. Get along with everybody. Or to go on to all the world. And preach the gospel. Tell people how to have eternal life. And let God use you. Because there's people that are hurting. There's people that don't know. Aren't you glad you know you're going to heaven? What, wouldn't they know? What, wouldn't they be glad? And somebody be able to stand someday at the judgment seat of Christ and says, I just want to say I'm thankful for this person right here that led me to Christ. Or that woman back there, my Sunday school teacher, she explained the gospel to me. Or my friend got me to come to church and I trusted Christ as my Savior. Maybe you didn't tell him, but you got him under the sound of the gospel. Let God use you in whatever way He wants. Where you are. Don't worry about reaching the world. Just reach the one you got. The one that's the closest to you. The neighbor that's right around you, wherever you're, you're abiding. And you'd be surprised what God might do. You. Leave a track here and there. You can't talk to me. Leave tracks. Get tracks out of the office. If you can't afford to buy them, take them. Sorry about that, Mike. I don't know Mike. But there's tracks back there in the rack. But take them and leave them at places. And just, just sow the seed. Just keep sowing the seed. Handfuls on purpose. Do it on purpose. Do it deliberately. Because you plan on doing it. You want to do it. Because you do care. And we do this individually. And we do it collectively. As a body of believers. That's why I want us to take on as many missionaries as possible. But we'll do it as the money comes in for it. And we get a little bit more than what we need. We'll take on another one. Get some more money. We'll, we'll take on another one. And then we'll just split it between the missionaries that we have. And so God's been good to us. And now just about every month we get, we're having six or $700 that comes in just for missionaries. Ain't that right, Mr. Polson? Just because people give a little bit over and above. And I thank you for that. This is our sins, the wallet. And God says that we have all sinned. Everybody's a sinner. We've all done things wrong. But God loves us. Now, He hates our sin. He hates that. But He loves us. God loves you. And he says to pay for this sin is eternal separation from God. And because God is a just, holy God, he has to condemn sin. It has to be paid. And so God says to go to heaven, you have to be perfect as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. We've all sinned and come short of God's perfection. So because of sin, we can't get in. God says you can't earn your way to heaven. It's not by going to church. It's not by giving money. It's not by your works. There's nothing you can do. God says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's why we don't ask you to join the church to go to heaven. But we don't ask you to give money to go to heaven. Because going to heaven is free. It's a gift. You see, this hand represents Jesus Christ, He God in the flesh. He came into the world and paid for our sins. And He says, it's free. He'll put this payment to your account freely. All you got to do is believe He did it for you. If you believe He did it for you, He gives you His eternal life as a gift, and you get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for you. Can't get any better than this. Best news in all the world. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, right where you're sitting, you can do that. And if you're listening by way of internet, right where you are, you don't promise anything, you don't stop anything, you don't join anything. All you got to do is receive. Receive the free gift of eternal life. And God says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. When you believe he did it for you, he saves you and gives you eternal life, and you get to go to heaven on what Christ did. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed, and no one looking around, if you're here this morning, and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I pray that you'll do so. I'm not going to have you forward, not going to embarrass you. But right where you're sitting, if what I said made sense, you say, yes, I want to be certain of going to heaven when I die. And I believe that Jesus Christ died and paid for my sins. And right now, the best I know how, I will accept Him as my Savior. Friend, God said, if you'd trust Him, 
He would save you and give you eternal life and you get to go to heaven. If you reject Christ as your Savior, like it or not, you'll spend an eternity in hell and it don't have to be that way. If you're watching by internet, why not right where you are? Just say, Lord, I don't understand it all. I know I've done things wrong. But I believe you died on that cross and paid for my sins and I'm going to trust you to take me to heaven when I die. Friend, I pray you'll do that. With heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone at all say, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior this morning and preach, I'd like you to pray for me. Just slip it up very quickly. Put it right back down. No one at all. No one at all. You that have trusted Christ as your Savior, will you endeavor to fulfill the responsibility that God's given to you? Take all your excuses and set them aside. Whatever the excuse is, put it aside. God will not accept excuses. He will accept none. He has given to you the power to do what He gave you to do. Our Father, we thank You so much for all You've done. We thank You for this good church, these good people. They know You and they love You. We're thankful for the ministries You've given us. We ask Your blessings upon each one and those that listen by Internet.